Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, National Plant Health Week webinar, looking at grey squirrel damage. Uh, we've got some fantastic speakers for you covering um, a range of different topics. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves and the many hats they wear as we go forward. Um, and we'll follow up their presentations with Q&A sessions. Um, thanks to those that have already sent in questions. Um, and if anyone else wants to ask anything, then please use the chat function. I'll keep an eye on it and collect questions as we go. Um, but before we go to our first live speaker, um, thanks to the Red Squirrel Survival Trust and the team at DEFRA, we have a message from DEFRA's Lords Minister, uh, Lord Gardner of Kimball. I will just share my screen. First National Plant Health Week as part of the International Year of Plant Health. Throughout the week, DEFRA will be highlighting what action you can take to help keep our plants and trees healthy. Without healthy plants and trees, the ecosystem suffers. We need them to survive. If we wish to protect our treescapes, not only for our children and grandchildren, but also for the economic that trees provide. It is of paramount importance that we continue to tackle the threats posed to plant health with ingenuity and resilience. In this Plant Health Week, we should promote awareness of the benefits our plants and trees provide and the threats they are facing. Invasive non-native species are among the top threats facing our biodiversity and ecosystems. As our native species have no natural defences against their direct effects, all the diseases non-native species carry. Bark stripping caused by grey squirrels reduces both the timber value and yield of trees and increases the risk of the affected trees succumbing to other pests and diseases. Grey squirrels are not only the species responsible for bark stripping, but due to high densities of grey squirrels, their damage is far greater than we could expect to see naturally. This bark stripping impact upon woodland creation and at DEFRA we are committed to planting more trees and ensuring they are protected. This reiterates the imperative for the humane control and management of grey squirrels to protect our trees and native red squirrels. I am pleased therefore that forest research have published technical advice for landowners on the best methods for controlling grey squirrels. In addition to this, the Forestry Commission are helping landowners manage risks in line with the Grey Squirrel Action Plan for England by working with you all at the Squirrel Accord in addition to other important partners. As many of you will be aware, as of December last year, it is unlawful to release a Grey Squirrel into the wild in England, bringing England in line with the rest of the United Kingdom. This is why in collaboration with the UK Squirrel Accord, DEFRA are supporting our scientists at the APHA, who are working hard to find an oral contraceptive for grey squirrels. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic causing some delays, the project is progressing well, and I understand that this summer they completed an important field trial to quantify how often grey squirrels visit hoppers and feed from bait that in the future will contain the contraceptive. In the next two months, the team will restart the testing of two different oral contraceptives and will report the results by the end of winter. The team also engages with many volunteer groups involved in squirrel control. These groups have shown significant support for the project and will be crucial in delivering oral contraceptives in the wild. In closing, I thank you all for the vital work you do to protect the native red squirrels and I wish you well with your discussions today. <coughs> Thank you to Lord Gardner for his support for Tree Health and National Plant Health Week. Uh, and now we move to our first speaker, Graeme Taylor. So um, if uh, the rest of us just shut our videos and our microphones down, and Graeme, if you are happy to share your screen. Share <laughs> my screen, yes. Let me just sort this out. Uh, all right. Sorry. Uh, now I've done it wrong again. Resume, so oh, slideshow, here we go. From the beginning, right click, 
Dave, David, if you just switch your video off. Sorry. Oh, hold on. And show. On the beginning. Show presenter view. There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's very kind of Kay to invite me to speak at this conference. Um, for those that you don't know me, I'll just say a little bit about myself. I'm a forester. I help run a forestry company based in Hereford in the Welsh Borders, which is where I spent most of my working life. Um, and uh, the first 10 years of my career got slowly but surely got very frustrated with the impact of grey squirrels. We were doing lots of control with warfarin and it wasn't working very well. I'm seeing lots of damage after seven to 10 years of planting, planting broadleaf trees in, in the beautiful environments that we work in. And so I got involved in ESI and slowly but surely been working away on trying to find very effective me methods of control, trying to encourage the, the, the uh, forestry industry to, to think about it. And uh, I'm now currently chairman of ESI as well as uh, running a company that's, that manages forests. And slowly but surely as, I've, as, as the company's grown, we've seen more and more uh, broadly forests uh, across the nation. And, and the more I see, the more I am concerned, to be honest, about the condition you look at the uh, woods that were planted after the 1987 storm in southeast England, and you you look 30 years on, and, and all the all the oak and the sweet chestnut and the beech that were planted and the birch, you know, the majority of it's just been really put badly damaged by squirrels, um, and and that's been repeated uh, on Paul's restoration sites. That's been repeated on new plantings. It's been repeated. We'll hear late a bit later uh, problems in the national forest. And, and so this is a really, you know, this is a national big deal. So I'm here to talk about really about the economic impacts, uh, both on an individual woodland basis, but a little bit later in my talk, I'll talk about uh, uh, how much is this costing the nation in, in forestry and forestry economics. This is a quite a big subject and there's not enough time to give it justice, but um, uh, when you're thinking about the economic impacts on ecosystems, Though when you start looking at ecosystem numbers and the economic economics of that, you're getting some very, very big numbers uh, and, and greater minds than mine have applied themselves to that. Some of the natural capital figures are in the billion in terms of the value of these things in the billions. And you've got to try and work out, well, what's the gray school's impact on this? Um, I'm really going to be talking here as a forester, uh, bringing his own uh, deep understanding of the forestry world and the forestry market and the timber market and then applying it to kind of national figures but also just looking to help you uh, observers understand what impact that has uh, on uh, on broadleaf trees my foresters get so wound up by <laughs> by gray squirrels uh, let's move on to the next slide so apologize i don't know how many foresters there are in the room um or on the, at the conference um if if you're a forester here i apologize you'll probably know some of much of what i'm planning to say but i'm really trying to convey something to non-foresters today um so you can understand why the gray squirrel has such a big impact on uh broadleaves uh, the, the econo economics of growing broadleaf trees as a as a commercial crop um, the slide in front of you that you can see, uh, the tree on the left is a 140 year old oak tree. It was felled uh, a few years ago. Um, after 140 years, that's three and a half foresters' careers. Um, and most of the, the investment in that tree actually took place in the first 10 to 12 years of that, its life. The rest, the rest is mainly time and a little bit of nurturing by successive generations of foresters. The tree on the left sold for about 2,000 um, pounds. Uh, you, you, you might say that the price is never high enough. I don't think it ever is high enough for the time that it's been in the ground. Um, but it, it went to a high-end use. Uh, it now adorns the Crown Estate building in St. James in London uh, and is part of the veneered panelled walls there. I want, I just want to take you back a bit in the, in the cycle of forestry. The main issue that foresters and landowners face is that to achieve that beautiful tree that I've just shown you, um, what matters is what happens in the first 10, 15, 20, 30 years of its life. Um, uh, and, and if that goes well, then you can achieve that end goal. If it, fail, if it doesn't, you, you fail. And that's why the early nurturing matters. 
and it, it, it's frustrating really because uh, you can spend the, that money the first 10 15 years look doing everything right and then literally overnight this happens and we're not just talking about this on one tree we're talking about this on quite a number of trees in the first year and if you're not on top of control it keeps going and so you go from uh, what was a beautiful stand to dereliction over a period of several years. So how, it, how extensive is it? Well, uh, it, it is massive, I already alluded to. Uh, Forest Research in Wales in the mid-1990s undertook a survey of grant-aided restocks uh, and replanting areas. These, these areas that have been felled and replanted with broadleaves and over 95% uh, were showing evidence of quite bad gray squirrel damage. Uh, yeah, ranging from extreme to moderate. Um, most foresters dealing with lowland woodlands uh, would say that the most serious pest, you know, we hear a lot about oak decline, we hear a lot about ash dieback, a whole host of other tree species, but if, if there's a big one, they would all say, actually, the grey squirrel is the big one. The damage happens, as I've shown you through the slides, it's repeated. We know it's nationally extensive, um, and we know that, that the young trees, they grow into the susceptibility from age seven, eight, ten years. I've had squirrel damage on six-year-old trees, well, past grown trees, but six-year-old trees. We also know that that effect is, long, is over a long period of time, over decades. In fact, you know, you, we will feel it into the, into the centuries. It's indiscriminate to land ownership. It has effects on both urban and rural trees. Uh, a lot of amenity trees, trees are affected by grey squirrel damage and we know that it's on a wide range of species. So let's just talk about species for a minute. On the, uh, the left hand column there you've got uh, a list of highly susceptible species and lo and behold if you go down that list most of those are our semi-natural species that we are trying to establish and have been encouraged to plant and encouraged to nurture over the last well since the 1985 broadleaf policy was introduced. Uh, middle column there is a, a range of other species that get damaged, but less so. Um, what's significant there, as I've already mentioned, is that it, when the ash crisis came along, one of the reasons that, that we have so much ash is that we foresters, uh, whenever we do a planting, uh, will have always put more ash in because we know it's the one that we get through. And that and ash is such a you know, great species on many sites, apart from extremely acid soils. Uh, so the ash was always a component and ash would always get through but now ash is not getting through in fact it's, having got through it's the one that's succumbed to ash dieback and so you're reverting back to more highly susceptible species and then that leaves you with a grey squirrel problem um, and then there's the, the trees that don't get affected by grey squirrel damage um, and and so for those who would say who would argue for no control who I think are a very small but vocal minority um, that's the kind of forest on the right hand side there that we are going to end up with. Uh, cherry, alder dominated, Sitka spruce, Douglas fir, most of the conifers and a few, few other broadleaves. And mo many of those don't have a commercial value. Uh, and the only ones that do have commercial value are the conifers. Uh, so you're, you're really narrowing your economic outlook, you're narrowing your species range. And actually that's, that flies all in the face of what uh, the noise about climate change is. Is, so we've got to diversify and maintain good wide diversity of trees. So I've shown you what happens to uh, an image of a few trees. Now, how, what about, uh, does it happen at stand level? Uh, you know, the image I've just present there is, is at a stand level. We're doing more work in Southeast England and I'm seeing acres and acres and acres of this. This, this was in the Chilterns planted in 1990 after, well, in 1991 after the 1990 storm. Uh, there was 20, 30 acres of this, the whole lot. Uh, oak planted at 1100 stones per hectare, every single tree written off, wasn't even, before, you know, wasn't even going upwards. Um, uh, and that was just in one woodland and there's more, you know, there, there's, you know, there's more woodlands than that. The canopies are not developing. So what is the impact of the damage on tree physiology? You get the loss of, the key thing in terms of nurturing that long-term beautiful oak tree into 150 years is that you lose the leader. And the loss of leader really, really matters because uh, you, you then get forking. And once you get forking, you, you lose that straight bowl. Once you lose that straight pole, you never achieve timber. And never ever. And, and by default then it has much reduced value. 
you get damage to branches that causes weaker branch unions and then introduces fungal attack. You get wounds that causes callus growth, uh, leaves the tree susceptible to fungal and bacterial infection, uh, rot and stain, and whole, ultimately whole tree instability. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't look right in terms of normal shape because it isn't. Um, there is an increased cost of harvest because the trees won't, won't go through mechanised systems. There is increased, increased health and safety risks for, for forestry staff and the general public. Uh, on the road networks, an increased likelihood of branch snap and tree failure. And ultimately, if the trees are badly ring bark, they die. Uh, you get reduced sap flow and subsequent crown damage and loss of increment and therefore by default reduced carbon sequestration. All of that adds up to quite significant change. Sorry about noise in the background. Um, so if, the, if it's that extensive, what's known about the, the total costs? Well, the published figures uh, historically been arranged eight to 10 million pounds, various studies uh, over the last, uh, um, last 10 years to, uh, to assess that. When you look at the detail of those figures, there appears to have been calculated are uh, calculated using um, disc inappropriately high discount rates, which actually uh, don't, which skew the maths considerably. Uh, in addition, the, ma the market is always moving and falling and timber prices, timber prices rise and fall. And currently oak prices are very strong, have continued to be strong, and hence the losses are actually higher. We've been, I've been, later on in my talk, I'll take, be taking a, my own fresh look at the numbers, and I know, uh, that the uh, Squirrel Accord have been have commissioned their own study and funnily enough we've come to kind of more or less the same conclusion which I find quite interesting. So why do we get so irritated and upset about grey squirrel damage and its impacts? Why do we feel the need to control the problem and humanely seek to control and limit the damage? So I want to uh, plan over the next few minutes to give you a snapshot of the economics of a forester's life. The actions we take over a period of uh, 100, 120 years to achieve a good outcome, a high quality tree, a useful tree, a tree that contributes to a sustainable economy. So here's a typical replant. This is a, this is a felling area inside a, a semi-natural woodland. Uh, you, you could be looking at a, a field that's been planted with broadleaves. So we essentially, we plant the trees. We weed those three or four times over the following seasons. We, use a, we, we do a thing called beating up, which isn't uh, what happens on a Friday night in the centre of town somewhere. We, that's a phrase to replace the losses that you, you the, the, the natural losses typically 10 to 15 percent after the first year and then we might do a little bit of formative pruning. Now here's the same site about seven years on well established and you think oh great I can wait you just wait now for a bit of growth. After 12 to 15 years you might need to intervene to start to respace to favor the better stems. You, you again as foresters we're looking for those straighter stems because those are the ones that ultimately will deliver that value in that over the very long term. And you might start to do a little bit of high pruning on some of those trees. By 20 to 25, you begin that thinning cycle, typically removing 20% of the standing volume and 25% of the standing trees, uh, removing the poorest, favoring the best, and selecting some further for, for some high pruning. And that cycle of thinning continues every eight to 10 years uh, and proceeds for another eight to 10 cycles. Uh, the image that you can see there is a recently thin 60 year old oak stand in, in lowly conditions looking very very well. I'm uh, really happy with that one. By 120 years the stands are in the mature phase and you're starting to think right if these things are ripe 140 years we're ready to start again. It's a long-term business um, and with a lot of carefully timed actions with a lot of a, a lot significant investment right at the start uh, and, and the way I like to describe to people who don't understand it is to say it's a, it's a bit like parenting if you get those child you, know, you get the child through to becoming a fully functioning adult it takes lots of money it takes experience it takes nurture uh, you, you've got to protect them against uh, vulnerable you know, to, to things that will harm and those external pressures uh, and if you don't then there's potential for disaster uh, the same as with, great, with, with growing broadleaf trees uh, over a long period of time. And, uh, and that's basically forestry, what, happened, what foresters do in a, in, in a minute or so. So what about the costs? Uh, this is a quick slide, just illustrates a number of things. When we plant trees as foresters, we have to consider a number of issues. Uh, spacing, uh, the density at which you plant the trees. 
uh, the relative cost of one species against another. Uh, and then in particular, is the cost of protecting that tree against browsing creatures, specifically hares, rabbits and deer, but also voles uh, and other, other browsing creatures. This table explains some of those variabilities on costs. And uh, I just updated them uh, yesterday, but it kind of illustrates the, the range. So if you're plant at the minimum end, if you're planting 1100 trees per hectare, which is trees at three meters spacing, and you don't have to protect against deer or rabbits, and you, you're just happy and you bung them in, it, and it costs you 880 pound a hectare. However, in most places there's deer and rabbits, and you then have to uh, put these other forms of protection on. And the typical one, which I've highlighted there on the right, is the tree in the tall shelter to protect against deer and rabbits. Uh, 1100 cents per hectare, three pound 80 a tree, gives you a cost of 4,000 pounds a hectare. Uh, in some situations, you might choose to plant uh, more densely uh, for all sorts of uh, good forestry reasons. Uh, in fact, it, it, it does deliver better, better selection and better crops. Um, but clearly, if you're planting 2,700 stems per hectare in a, in a shelter, you're looking at a cost at three pound eighty four quid nowadays. You, 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 you're heading towards ten thousand pound a hectare cost. That's quite a considerable cost. Typically, there you, you put a deer fence up. But that's the kind of range, and I, I, the reason I just highlight that is that you know it's quite a bit of money in the first off, um, but it doesn't stop there. And uh, particularly, I'd highlight there that the there are significant costs attached to deer, and and wild deer presence. Um, uh, and the way I put this to clients is, look, you, you're very excited when you're getting five to ten grand a year deer, deer income, but actually, if you're having to uh, plant or restock them and, and protect against a deer, uh, and it, it, you're having to incur additional, you know, three to eight thousand pound a hectare cost because of that, you, you've got to look at that maths very closely. Uh, and actually, deer are, my view, not an asset; they're a liability. So anyway, you've then planted, done your planting, you do your weeding, etc., and the investment's going ahead, cleaning, pruning, your, your trees start to look like this. But then disaster strikes. What about the future impact? You've made that investment. What does the future income stream look like now that the stand has been damaged irrevocably? You, you... So here we are, here's a comparison. This is what happens when you fail. I fail to protect your trees. Um, you get, and these figures assume a number of things. You get a reduced volume of recovery of yield. Basically, the tree isn't growing as fast, and when you harvest, you recover less of it. So even when you're thin, you get less of it out because you can't actually physically get at the wood. If you fail, it becomes firewood. It doesn't become timber, it becomes firewood. And there's a differential in the price between timber and firewood. And as you go through the rotation, you get a reduced volume, uh, but it's stuck at that firewood price of 30 pounds a ton standing. When you look at that in terms of the total value or volume, do you remember going back to the last slide I showed you that this stuff is costing six, seven, eight, ten thousand pound a hectare to establish? You're looking in 150 years at something that's worth seven thousand pounds a hectare. You're no further forward, in fact you're probably behind what you've spent. Now to anyone's sense that's like growing a crop, of, so putting all the seeds growing a crop of wheat and, and recovering less value than you put in. That makes no sense at all and, and, and makes no, gives you no return for, for the landowner. It's, in fact, it's a disaster economically. So let's compare this with a, an environment free of grey squirrels like France or Germany, uh, where you spend the same, and you've or, or in the UK where you've successfully controlled your grey squirrel and you've helped the stand to develop normally. And that is the cash flow of the same 30, 60, 90, 120 year old crop that you can see as the uh, as the crop matures, it, it becomes increasingly value valuable. The volume is higher, and and you've got you achieve at maturity. Yeah, you know, fifty thousand pound a hectare is not an unreasonable sum for mature oak in today's world. So there's the difference. That's the difference between success and failure, and I, I describe that as the opportunity cost of failure. At each age, and it ratchets up as you go through. Uh, across the ages. So I've highlighted there the yellow box, there's the four plant, 4,000 pound a hectare plant, that's just the planting cost. Uh, by the time you've done the weeding uh, and maintenance etc you, you're probably up to 7,000 pound a hectare and as I say uh, well, 7 to 10,000 pound a hectare and you, your damaged crop is not covering the cost of establishment. The value of oak keeps rising uh, through the latter stages um, 
and the cost of failure is quite high. Um, and I would say, for those who ask the question I, and say, I can't afford to do the control, which is anything between 20 and 40 pounds a hectare, 50 pounds a hectare, depending on how you're doing it, um, the, the loss of 47,000 pounds over 140 years is close, is a significant, yes, 500, 600 pounds a hectare. You, you can afford to do this, or if you don't, you will reap what you sow. So these figures are based on one hectare of full damage. I, as I say, the, I know the Accord is doing its, uh, has done its own study, but I've, I, I sat back and done a death study based on all the knowledge and understanding that I have and you looking at the uh, National Forest Inventory data. So I apologise, I hope you can see this slide um, and I can send it on to anybody who, who's interested. This is my best estimate for England uh, using the up-to-date National Forest Inventory. Uh, my colleague uh, developed a damage scale of, of one to five. Five is dead, one is modest damage, uh, three is kind of half damage. Um, if you're uh, down at the low end, through, through manage, of damage, you can manage those crops through uh, because you can selectively remove them. And if you keep control, you can still get a proportion of the crop through. When you, when you plant, uh, you only need 100 trees a hectare to get to the end, but they need to have been undamaged all the way through the process. So let me explain how I put this, uh, put this table together. I've taken each of the species and said, look, they're not all the same, uh, uh, particularly oak. oak. Oak on certain sites grows into very high quality, high value material. On many a site, it's like a medium quality tree. In certain sites, you never, you know, like the Western fringes of, 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 of England, you're, and you know, some of the uplands, you're really not gonna grow much timber. It's, it's gonna be bent and twisted anyway. And they each have a yield class. So I've given them like a quality class. And then I've said, well, what's the undamaged? Uh, so, and that goes down to for beech and sweet chestnut, sycamore and birch. Each have their own yield growth models and each have their own value in the market. And I've said, what happens to those, what would happen to those stands if they developed fully to maturity, undamaged? And then what is the value actually when they get damaged? And taking the two, uh, uh, apart and said taken one from the other and then actually that creates your your loss your theoretical loss and then put a, an average rotation on that and so you know clearly they grow at different rates you know your beech tree is typically 160 180 year old tree oak is 120 150 sometimes 180 etc and then the green column is is the data that comes out of the international forest inventory and it basically says um what is the total hectareage of that kind of species of uh, that kind that species across England and what is um, and what is the proportion that of age that's in that age class and we know because uh, we, we do <laughs> we know that uh, damage has been going on for 60 70 years but I've, I've worked on 60 um, and then what proportion of that species what proportion of that uh, species is in that age class and what proportion of that age class is in that quality class and I've come up with a figure and then you so that you multiply the total hectares that have been damaged by the total loss that happens when you get damage and that's come up with a figure and it's uh, it's come up with a figure of 2.4 billion over 60 years which fun, which is it always bang on when I, I was amazed when I pressed the press the button actually and it came out with a figure of about 40 million pounds a year and I, I then sit back and say is that reasonable well in the context of earlier studies it's higher but I still think it's reasonable. And the reason I think it's reasonable, if you look at the average hectareage, 128,000 hectares over 60 years, is, is 2,000 hectares a year. We know we've been planting, you know, back in the 90s, we were planting uh, 12, 14,000 hectares of, of broadleaves. Uh, just at the moment, we're planting, not very, we're planting 1,400 hectares a year in England, but we're felling and restocking um, three or 4,000 hectares. So. And we know that the majority is getting damaged. We know that fact. So that figure of 2,000 hectares a year is probably about right. And that's why I'm confident that my figure of 30, well, near, bang on 40 million a year is probably about right. I worked out the figures for, for the damageable conifers as well in England. That was a much more reduced value because A, it, it still commands a value if it's damaged. Uh, they still grow. 
and B, uh, there's less of it around. But it's, uh, it's about uh, 2.4 billion. But that's not the end of it, because what's happening slowly is attrition. And we're halfway through a, an oak tree cycle. The majority of the value is attributable to the oak, and we're halfway through a cycle, 120 years. And we are slowly harvesting out uh, Victorian oak trees, and we're not replacing them. There's still 40 to 60 years of this, unless we get on top of this, there's another 40, 60 years of effect to come. And the failure to, for those stands to produce oak means you actually have to then add to the import bill because we want wood. Uh, we know that we import around 14 billion pounds of hardwood timber a year. Because we're not producing it here, we know we, that's what the import bill is. It's actually the fourth largest import bill, net import bill behind um, food, fuel and cars. And energy, sorry, it's the fifth, yeah, from food, fuel, yeah, yeah energy. Um, and you, then you say, well, actually, if this oak is not, if these stands are not producing that value, uh, what, what value am I we're going to have to buy in 50, 60 years time? Because the stuff we've been planting the last 60 years has failed. And that because it's sawn timber, it's actually a bigger number. Um, I've got my undamaged, this, I've just done the numbers for oak, the undamaged value per hectare, that translates into how, a hardwood timber volume that comes off that hectare, that has a certain value in terms of grades in the market. Then you realise that the import cost per hectare is quite considerable and you again apply the damage, damage figures and you realise that the numbers are even bigger. And we're talking about 6.6 .6 billion uh, or annualised, that's 110 million pounds a year. So, and that's going to rise, yeah, for future generations, that's going to rise because we're failing because of gray squirrels. I'm, I'm running out of time, I better crack, crack on. Um, what about biodiversity? Well, uh, wooden habitats are affected and some species are directly affected by gray squirrel interactions. You've got the denudation of competition for food resources, affecting other small mammals. You've got, you've got the direct infection of parabox virus on red squirrels. You've got a, mo a modest but proven impact on wooden birds. And, and a contributory factor towards decline. Um, how do you put a value on that? I guess it, that depends on whether, whether you're a red squirrel, a vole, a domas, a mother bird, that each of they would say that's, that's, that's priceless. Be a man and woman in the street, they would say, they would agree with anything from priceless to, uh, you know, I don't give a stuff. Um, so what, what are the values of these things? Well. I've just had a look into what some of what the environmental economists are looking at. And um, uh, there was a study uh, that put the value of UK biodiversity back in uh, the 90s at about 22 billion pounds a year. Interestingly, the Forestry Commission more recently valued the natural capital value of their holding for that 200,000 hectares at 23 billion pounds, which, which gives that a figure of 110,000 pounds a hectare, which you, could, which you couldn't buy it for because woodland doesn't cost that much. Uh, uh, but nevertheless shows actually that, that there is a value. So what impact are gray squirrels having on there? Well, I would say, well, you could say a minimum of 1% one, 1 decline on, on all sorts of things. I, I think that would be reasonable, which it puts a, a kind of natural capital value of 1,100 pounds a hectare on every hectare that's of woodland, where gray squirrels are present. Um, I could talk, you could talk about um, carbon carbon we know that the impact is quite large on on yield it is 10 10 to 15 percent um probably a bit more we haven't really studied that hard enough it's something i'm keen in the esi to do but i know uh, also on going back to biodiversity that we are um that it makes makes decision making for foresters take take your average plantation ancient woodland site uh, if you're confident about getting uh, oak and mixed broadies away on the next next site, you, you you might consider restoring that site, and that delivers not just the kind of the forestry benefit, but the biodiversity benefit associated with that change away from conifers. But many many conifers, uh, many folk aren't confident, and so they 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 said, you know, I'm not confident, uh, and I'm going to stick with my Douglas fir. Uh, and that's that's quite a big deal for wider biodiversity. Um, we know also from um, studies that if you speak to the insurers that there's 20 million pounds a year plus damage to people's property caused by gray squirrel. 
So you look at annual timber losses of 40 million pounds a year, cumulatively 2.4 billion. The future import bill from 2080 is 110 million pounds a year. Uh, that cumulative import bill to date will be 6.4 billion. Uh, property damage, 20 million pounds a year. Carbon losses, three. I think that's an under, under, understatement. Uh, and biodiversity losses, anything between 1.2 and 54 million pounds per annum. These are all so slightly made up numbers. The forestry ones are real numbers applied to, yeah, everything else is kind of like uh, environmental economist numbers. Nevertheless, it does add up. Um, it adds up considerably. Uh, so any, anything, the headline figures, I would say, we're, we're probably costing about 200 million pounds a year plus because of grey squirrel damage. Now that's quite a lot of money and that's being spread across insurance claims uh, across uh, lost income to the rural economy for the type of rural economy that the nation is wanting us to have which is kind of lowland broadly woodland economy and that's there's money that's being lost because of gray squirrels and i just put this slide up last last slide um this subject make an excellent phd thesis i i i've i've tried to draw some figures together quickly from in terms of time that I had available for the presentation. And I just put this slide up because it's one I use often um, in different audiences, but it, it just compares us with France and Germany um, and, and, and why the grey squirrel makes such a big difference. So you've got, we are countries of uh, similar populations. Uh, France is a little bit bigger than well, France is almost the same size as Germany and UK put together. It's a big, big country, but the same population as the UK. Uh, the broadleaf forest area, they have considerable amount broad, more broadleaves than we do. They have 13 million hectares. We have one and a half. Uh, so that ratio is nine to one. And the Germans have uh, three times the amount of broadleaf forest area than we do. Then you look at their hardwood production uh, figures and, and it's quite, there's quite considerable differences. France produces 4.1 million cubic meters of, of uh, timber, much of that is oak. Much of it now goes to to oak uh, to um, uh, to China to be turned into oak furniture land kind of uh, furniture, and then gets in, exported all around the world to places like the UK. Uh, Germany is a little bit uh, behind, but not much on their hardwood production uh, compared with French, despite having a, a much reduced air, air. Look at our figures: seventy-five thousand cubic meters per year of UK hardwood timber. It used to be a million. We're at 75,000. Uh, so the ratio, the French produce 54 times what we do, the Germans 46 times what we do. Uh, and the, you then look at this, well, actually on efficiency terms, the hardwood production uh, out of France is tip, 0.3 cubic meter per hectare per annum. The Germans do 0.74 per hectare per annum and we do 0.05 per hectare per annum, which shows, might not be surprised to the audience that the Germans are more efficient than anybody else in Europe. Why does it matter? Well, whether you're France or Germany, they don't have to deal with the grey squirrel. It's not there yet. It's on the southern fringes of the Alps, and if they're not careful, they'll have it in France and Germany too. Um, it's kind of why it matters. Uh, you know, there's a sense in the world that we don't need you know, you, people have, have lost that contact between wood production, wood, and where it comes from, trees. Um, the demand for wood is going to increase exponentially because actually wood is a sustainable product and uh, coal brick and uh, steel brick and concrete are not. Um, if we can't do it here because the grey squirrel will be failing. And, and I'll just leave a final thought. Everybody's very, very keen on that whole word sustainability. I am. I, I'm a belie fundamental believer in sustainability. But if we cannot replace our oak, our sweet chestnut, our beech stands for the next generation, what does the FSC accreditation that we all like to subscribe to and sustainability criteria really mean? Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Graham. Um, and now we'll move on to, if you've got any questions for Graham, please put them in the chat. <laughs> I'll keep looking for them and we'll answer them later. Um, and now we'll move on to Dan. Are Morning, you everyone. To Thanks. Are you happy to switch your video off, Graham? Yeah, um, sorry. sorry. No, fine. Thank you. I have. I, I think I have. I? Stop screen share. Oh, no. If you turn your video off as well. 
Oh, so. hold on, hold on, <laughs> please. Unmute yourself, and then we can just see Dan. Yes, yeah, so I stop video. <laughs> Thank you. you. Morning, everyone. Thank you to Kay and UK Squirrel Accord for allowing me to do this presentation. I'll just set up the presentation now. Hopefully you can see that okay. Uh, I'll just give a quick introduction to myself. My name's Dan Small. Sorry, Dan, we can't see you. Oh, no. <laughs> you can't see me or you can't see- Well, we, can't, we can see you, but not your presentation. <laughs> okay, uh, let's try this differently then. Is that any better? No, it was working, wasn't it? Yeah. How's that? Oh, there we are. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Is that working okay? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Awesome. I'll try that again. Uh, my name is Dan Small. I'm the Woodland Management Officer at the National Forest Company. My main role is to travel around the National Forest area and provide advice and support to landowners in and around the National Forest on how they can manage their woodland uh, and then specifically about grey squirrel control as well. I'm going to talk about what the National Forest is, how grey squirrels are affecting the National Forest and what we're trying to do about it. So this is the National Forest area. Uh, it was established in the early 1990s by a gov uh, government plan to uh, plant a new forest uh, the area was decided by public vote, uh, so this area was voted by by the people that live within it. Uh, it's an area that has got a lot of degraded land uh, and lots of potential for tree planting. Uh, there's a long history of, of, of mining, uh, coal mining and uh, other mining, so this area has had lots of land degradation over the years uh, and with that restored land it's uh, suitable, most suitable for tree planting. It covers three, part, uh, three counties, uh, parts of three counties, Derbyshire, Leicestershire and Staffordshire, and it includes four towns. Uh, there's about 220,000 uh, 220, pe people in the National Forest, and about 8,000 businesses. It spans about 200 square miles, and the extent is from pretty much the edge of Leicester right through to on and further than uh, Burton upon Trent. Uh, you can see where the M run runs through on, on the right hand side of the National Forest. The National Forest has a new 25 year vision uh, and that's based over three themes, the three themes of sustainability. So environmental, economy and society. So the, the National Forest is trying to create a, th a thriving environment that supports a, a wide range of wildlife it's well connected and resilient to climate change whilst also capturing carbon. We're trying to create a circular economy that sees the benefits of buying local and a society that protects the forest whilst also benefiting, benefiting from its ecosystem services. So all of this, all of these three topics uh, are planned out in this 25 year vision. Uh, we're also trying to address climate change mitigation and adaptation and becoming an exemplar for sustainable living. Uh, the idea is that if people are looking about creating a sustainable way of living, they can look at the national forest and how we've introduced trees into the environment and see that as a, as a, as a template of how they can do it. So this is going to be a bit of an example about uh, how we do our planting. I'm going to try and use a pen laser. The laser pointer so you can see uh, this area here is uh, a, 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 an open cast coal mine uh, obviously in 1999 uh, they're just getting to the end of their uh, mining activity and this area is uh, due to be restored you can see across the rest of the landscape there's lots of open land lots of farmland uh, with a odd few urban areas mixed in as well so 
we have three main types of uh, delivery mechanisms for creating our, our landscape and creating our woodland. The first of them is through planning gain. So the urban areas that are created in the national forest as, as houses are developed, we've got uh, a section in the, in the planning ruling that I think it's 10, 10 to 15% of the land has to be put to, to tree planting. So uh, with this urban area that was created, the houses were built, this area was uh, put aside as tree planting. In that same way, uh, there's also planning gain from the mining. So this mine, as it's restored, uh, will get pushed over to woodland creation, and that's expanded across the, this area as well. The second method is land acquisition. So the National Forest is able to, to purchase land, plant it up, and pass on to uh, partner organisations to manage on in the future. And the third way of doing it is through grants. So CLS stands for Changing Landscape Scheme. So this landowner in the farm here, uh, they may have wanted to uh, plant this woodland. So it's a bit of screening from the mining work. There's a road along here, so a bit of screening from the road. And it might also be the, the low grade land that they aren't farming productively. So they can put across to, um, put across to woodland. The grants that we provide uh, can cover about up to 100% of the cost of woodland planting. So essentially, they'll get that woodland for free. Uh, they don't have any cost involved with that. And it's a good opportunity for, for uh, a landowner to provide other benefits to themselves, such as a screening, such as landscape, such as uh, habitat creation, uh, for, for no cost to themselves. So this is what it looks like in 2017. Um, you can see that the the, the mine has been uh, restored. It's now uh, had a lot of restoration work that's been undertaken. It's all been capped off. If I just switch back to the uh, previous slide, you can see that this wood, bit, tiny bit of woodland was, was retained during the, the mining activity. And this is where the woodland is now. Uh, for those of you that know the National Forest, this is Hicks, Log, Hicks Lodge uh, Cycle Center. So you can see that the cycle paths uh, uh, have been introduced around the site uh, and also into the woodland as well. You can see the trails all around here. Uh, the screening and uh, grant woodland has, has now developed and is really enclosed this, this uh, farm farmhouse and is providing a, a good landscape and there's a potential for increasing the, the value of the, the farmhouse and the, and the urban dwellings in this area as well because of the uh, improved landscape. You're not looking at a mining activity. You're enclosed by woodland. It can be quite uh, attractive to some people. The planning gain from the houses has also developed and is uh, providing open space for people within these houses to explore. There's a route that can, so if you live in this village, there's a route that can take you through the woodland uh, over to Hicks Lodge. You can spend a day. There's a, uh, a, a cycle rental uh, center with also, also a cafe. So this woodland creation is providing economic uh, opportunities for the local area as well. And there's also the very obvious biodiversity benefits. There's a, a huge increase in, in habitat, not only woodland, but there's open grazing, uh, uh, conservation grazing, there's wetland habitats that's been introduced. There's a, a range of uh, plant structure. So there's not only uh, developed trees, there's young trees that are growing on. And within this, there's lots of, lots of mixtures of habitats as well. So, Back in 1991, which is when I was born actually, uh, so uh, the forest cover within the National Forest area was at 6%. So much of the woodland that you can see in the green, the urban areas in the dark green, roads are in black uh, and waters in blue. Uh, much of the woodland area that you can see is the remnants of uh, ancient charmwood, which is at the uh, eastern end, uh, needwood at the western end, and the Melbourne Parklands, which are in the centre. A lot of the land in between was either uh, agricultural land or 
mining land. Um, and there's a, a, a whole range of reasons why that woodland has uh, disappeared from these, these ancient woodland areas. But the idea of the National Forest was to link these two ancient woodland areas with a, a con continuous stream of woodland in between. And if we skip to 2020, we're now at 21% woodland cover. You can see that a lot of the, the woodland, the, there's been woodland created in the uh, ancient Charmwood and Needwood areas, as well as the parklands. But a lot of this area in between has filled in. I'll just skip back so people can see. And it's, a, it's a huge change. Uh, the 21% woodland cover equates to about 10,000 hectares. Uh, for those of you that don't know a hectare, it's about the size of a football or rugby pitch. So 10,000 hectares is a big chunk. Our target is to reach 33% woodland cover. We're not trying to get wall to wall 100% uh, woodland cover across the land because we understand that there's obviously urban areas, other habitats such as wetland, heathland. Uh, there's also um, prime agricultural lands. We need to feed people. Uh, so the, the, the target for 33% 33, 33 woodland cover uh, should be achieved in the next 25 years if we can continue planting about 238 hectares a, uh, a year. Uh, and on average of 1,175 trees per hectare, based on there being some open areas, some more dense areas, uh, that would need to mean that we'll need to plant about 7 million trees. So how does all of this uh, come down as to, uh, our, our aims and objectives for the woodland? So we obviously want to keep on with the forest creation. We haven't stopped our forest creation, uh, even though we're, we've increased up to that 20%, 21% woodland cover. We still got that aim to get to 33% in the, in the next 25 years. We want the forest to be economic. So we don't want it to just be uh, somewhere for people to visit or for uh, biodiversity. The, the woodland needs to be making money for people. And with that, we need to be uh, growing top quality broadleaf timber. And with all of those other uh, topics, there, there's going to be new job creation, not only in the forest area. Uh, so not only people hand cutting or people on machines in the woodland, there'll also be the, the knock on uh, job creation of, of uh, saw milling, uh, using that timber processing. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a, a new income stream that's available to the, to the National Forest area. So somewhere where it's got historic, uh, historically very low woodland cover, the mining industries were, were very active. And once the mining industry stopped, we are then seeing that the, the forest is a, is a new opportunity for those people that were working in the mines. They're able to transfer their skills and uh, work in, in woodland industries. And a bit like how Graham highlighted earlier, we don't want it to just be creating wood fuel. We want to be growing uh, trees that are suitable for beams and planks, so for sending to sawmills and that higher value uh, products. This is the type of woodland that I'd like to see. So harvesting good quality material, using appropriate and efficient machinery, uh, whilst also improving the habitats and improving the access. If I, if I was to see this in, in all the woodlands that I visit in the National Forest, I'd be a very happy person. Unfortunately, though, this is what I do see. So, grey squirrel damage. Uh, we have a huge, uh, huge problem with grey squirrels in the National Forest. Because we've created those 10,000 hectares of woodland uh, over the last 28 years, uh, we've got lots of woodland that is susceptible to grey squirrel control, uh, grey squirrel damage, sorry. Um, grey squirrels tend to only damage younger trees. Uh, so there's, you can see damage on, on trees anywhere from five to 40 years old. Uh, and with that, we've got pretty much all of our woodland is in that uh, vulnerable range. And we're also making the problem harder for ourselves as well. As we're planting more and more woodland, the connectivity of the, the national forest is increasing. That means that grey squirrels can travel easier between woodlands and makes the, the, the control effort harder. If you're controlling on one site that was separated from the rest of the habitats, you'd be, it would be easier to 
uh, eradicate that, that squirrel population, grey squirrel population, and you'd be able to protect it. Whereas if you've got lots of uh, ways of the grey squirrels traveling in and out of that woodland, the, the young from the uh, previous season are able to travel and they're able to uh, expand their range into, into the woodland that you're controlling. Now this is a problem for uh, landowners in the national forest. They've spent their money, they've had grant support, albeit, but they've spent their money, lots of time and effort establishing their woodland. Uh, they've gone through the, the phases that Graham discussed earlier of, of planting, protecting from the, the rabbits, the deer, the voles. Uh, they've uh, been doing weed control for uh, 10, 15, 20 years. And then they've got another thing to, uh, to worry about is the gray squirrel damage. And so because forestry and growing trees is such a long, long, long game, the, the woodland owner has been spending money all through that establishment phase. They get to the end of establishment and they think, great, we're able to uh, wait a couple of years, do a first thing and make some money. But this is where grey schools come in and cause problems and they'll start to do the damage and impact the quality that you're able to achieve. Unless the woodland owner is quite engaged and enthusiastic, there's not going to be any means of control that's happening uh, up until the stage where the damage from grey squirrels is really, re really apparent. And most of the time that's too late. The damage will be done and the, uh, the impact on the quality and the, the yield from the trees will have had its effect. And all of the effort from, from grey squirrel control from that point onward is going to be uh, an uphill battle. So this, uh, this damage that you can see on the screen here, uh, small patches, a couple of centimeters uh, across, you can see where the tree is starting to callus over. So the, st the tree is starting to repair that damage. Um, this kind of damage, it's bad. It, it opens the tree up to disease. Um, there's, the tree is gonna have to spend some effort in repairing itself. If this happens one year and then you control the squirrels and there's no more squirrels around, the tree will be able to repair and it won't be a, a massive impact. As I go through these slides, you'll see it more and more severe impact. Uh, going back to this one, this one's on a willow. Uh, this is on, the, uh, on an oak tree. So the, uh, as, as uh, Graham uh, explained earlier, the oak are, are quite susceptible. So the, the devaluation, um, as, De as Graham described, it is the, the real impact is on the form of the tree. Uh, people, uh, sawmillers like uh, tall straight trees, they're easy to, to run through the sawmill. So if the forking and the bushing uh, occurs, the loss of form, then that's gonna make the, the, the problem a lot harder and it's gonna decrease the, the economic value of, of that tree. And the likelihood is it will, if it is still growing, it will get used as firewood. Uh, but if you, there's the potential for, the, for that tree to be uh, uh, a veneer grade in the Crown Estate office, then, then you've lost out on a, on a lot of value. There's also environmental damage, decreased woodland uh, tree diversity. If the trees here, this is, I think this is beech or hornbeam. Uh, if the tree, if all of the beech in your woodland, you've got a, 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 an eclectic planting mix of uh, a range of species, so you've got 10 different species that you plant, all of the beech get damaged. Uh, the beech are, are the more susceptible species in your woodland, all of the beech get damaged and uh, succumb to, to squirrel damage, succumb to disease, get ring barked and die. You've lost the beech out of the, out of the species mix and you've lost diversity. And that, that won't just happen to beech, that can happen to beech, maple, oak, willow. You're, you're starting to lose that diversity of, of the, the planting mix. And with that loss of diversity in the, in the planting mix, you're going to the loss of value environmentally to uh, species that are reliant on these trees. You can see this damage. It's very different to the, the damage that I showed in, in the first image. Uh, 
this damage is running a good few meters way up the stem on this oak tree. This, this type of damage is going to be uh, severe and it's not going to be repairable. The tree is going to really suffer. Half of the crown of the tree is gonna die. Uh, if, the, if the control is, is, if the damage stops now, um, half of this tree canopy is gonna die off. It's gonna be a weak point. If the wind blows, the top's likely to snap out. The tree's lost its form, uh, it's lost its value. Same again here, this is almost the, the most severe you can get. You can see that the stripping has gone all the way around the stem, so it's ring barked. Uh, that means none of the nutrients can travel up and down the tree. The canopy is going to die out. And you can see here in the background, there's the silver birch that's growing here. It's romping away. It does grow quicker than uh, oak anyway. But if this line of oak trees here are all going to get squirrel damage, the silver birch is going to outcompete it there'll be no chance for the, for the oak trees to, uh, to, to compete for light. The squirrel damage is gonna knock out their canopies and the oak are gonna die off. Then again, that is decreasing the, the woodland diversity. This is what I uh, explained earlier about the top snapping out. So you can see that the, the leader of this, I think this is another oak tree, the leader of this oak tree has snapped out. The, the squirrel damage occurred here maybe it occurred uh, four, three, four years ago. The tree struggled to uh, repair itself and that's caused a weak point in the tree. The wind has blown, snapped the top out of the tree and you'll see the, the, uh, the branches down here are starting to try and uh, compete for their light again and you're, it's starting to bush out and lose its form. Uh, this is another example in a silver birch this time. Um, this is a, a good example of the uh, societal uh, risks caused by grey squirrel damage. Um, if this chap is walking along and it's a bit of a breezy day, the top of this tree is snapped out already uh, or it, it's weakened, the, the wind's blowing, snaps out, knocks him on the head, the landowner is going to have an issue. Uh, the chap walking under that's been knocked on the head is going to have an issue. And that's the kind of woodland that people are, are not going to want to be in. It doesn't look, look nice aesthetically. Uh, and there's also risks that are, uh, are there for people, animals within that woodland. So what is the National Forest doing about it? The National Forest has got a, a grey squirrel strategy and action plan. So this details to not only uh, the National Forest Company, but also all of the woodland owners in the National Forest area, what the current situation is, what our strategy is, how we plan to, to get there. We don't want to achieve uh, widespread eradication. Uh, that's, that's not gonna be achievable with the, the uh, control methods that we have in, in place at the moment. What we want to achieve is uh, a population level of squirrels which are, are going to, uh, they might undertake some damage, but the damage is going to be of the less severe end and is going to be easily repairable, easily managed, uh, and it, it, it's not going to be as much of that problem. We provide targeted landscape scale advice. On the next slide, I'll go into this a bit further, but what we don't want is one person absolutely blitzing the squirrels, doing really good work, only for their neighbor to not be doing anything at all. Some people even feeding the squirrels. Um, and every year, as the young of the, the uncontrolled woodland uh, grow on, they'll move, move out of that, that woodland and into the woodland that the, the, somebody is, is providing uh, control on. And that, that creates a never ending cycle uh, of not only effort, but money, uh, that's being spent on grey squirrel control. If we can achieve a, a landscape scale approach to, to grey squirrel control, that means that everybody's working together uh, for a, a common goal uh, and the, the effort, everybody's effort is going to be a lot less. The control methods are going to be much more efficient. We also have a woodland management grant. Uh, I mentioned it when I introduced myself. So this is a, a We've got 140,000 pounds in, in, in the budget and that can be spent by woodland owners on a range of things from, from uh, ride edge thinning, coppicing, putting up signage, 
but you also support grey squirrel control so people are able to to get support in in purchasing purchase of traps uh, but also the time spent managing those traps uh, and also for time spent being out using air rifle control or, or or other methods as well so we are we're conscious that the, the woodland owners in the national forest have spent a lot of time money and effort uh, establishing their woodlands and the woodland management grant is there to to help them through the uneconomic stages of woodless woodland management uh, up until they start making money through uh, their thinning uh, interventions so it's helping to bridge that gap helping to put them on on the right foot we're working with partners such as basque uh, uh, as to uh, uh, introduce control methods so basque are the british association of shooting and conservation uh, we're working with them to uh, introduce their members onto onto sites that I'll, I'll talk about a bit more in in the in a minute we're also trialing the use of uh, new and innovative traps so a lot of you will have heard about the good nature a18 trap so we've undertaken a trial of, of those traps and uh, trying to gain experience on these types of uh, new and innovative ways of, of undertaking tr control we can collect that knowledge up and share it around all of the woodland owners in the national forest and, and wider as well uh, so we undertake uh, days would uh, call them woodland owners club days so where people can come and see uh, examples of how to do things not only gray squirrel control but other woodland management so uh, that knowledge sharing knowledge collection and sharing is really important way of, of uh, helping to spread the message and, and achieve that landscape scale control. We also uh, have been putting, uh, supporting and uh, putting money into research. So as, as Graham mentioned earlier, the UK Squirrel Accord have been uh, commissioned uh, research onto the, the, the costs of grey squirrel control. So uh, the National Forest has been able to help support those kind of things as well. So as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, landscape scale control is, is really key. And part of uh, that approach, it's, it's important to understand where the effort is best spent. So uh, unfortunately, there's not a boundary on the national forest here, but it kind of runs around here, kind of that, that kind of shape. Um, so within that area, there's, there's three colors, the light blue, which is low risk, uh, the purple color which is medium risk and the red which is high risk uh, this risk is based on the age of the tree obviously when it's uh, under 10 years old there's there's less less risk of it being squirrel damaged uh, the species so uh, as as graham described earlier the the range of species that are most susceptible to, to gray squirrel damage uh, you can uh, pick and Pick and choose those species as to, to which is going to be the, the, the most, most at risk and also the connectivity so where there's lots of connectivity and there's uh, maybe the the woodland doesn't have uh, particularly high risk this one's separated from the high risk here uh, this is low risk but there's no connect connectivity between them whereas this area here there's lots of connectivity between them and there's a high risk so you'll see uh, this is the, the needwood forest uh, up here. There's lots of uh, mature woodlands, so low risk. Uh, the, uh, the trees got a, a, a strong and healthy bark on them that the squirrels aren't able to damage. So there's low risk here. Uh, same with the charmwood at this end. Uh, in between it, where we've done lots of our planting, this is where the, the medium and the high risk uh, areas uh, are. Uh, happening and it's key for us to concentrate our, our efforts in those areas to make sure that we're uh, trying to get on top of things so there's no point spending all of our time in needwood and charmwood saying yeah you need to uh, concentrate on your squirrel control because the the damage and the effect is not being felt there the first in, first port of call is to, to concentrate on these medium and high risk areas as these uh uh, under control then we can concentrate on on other areas so this type of mapping work and uh, GIS work so geographical information system work uh, is key to helping to uh, 
make sure our effort is, is best spent in, in certain areas. With the GIS systems, we're also able to map where control is happening. So currently, uh, the light green is all of the woodland in the National Forest, and the orange is, is where, control, where we know control is happening. Uh, this is really useful because you can help to, uh, with, with the landscape scale control. With this map, I can see that there's, there's a, a quite a good chunk of, of control that's happening in this area. And there's a few people in between, a few landowners in between that aren't doing anything. So I, I, my time is best spent trying to uh, fill in those gaps in between the woodlands, uh, trying to make sure that everybody's working towards grey squirrels, they understand the problems. A lot of the time when I go out to see a, a woodland owner, they'll be saying, oh yeah, the, the trees are looking a bit dodgy. Um, it might have been the, the water logging or the, or the dry summer or uh, I'll go out, I'll see, you can see where the tops of the trees are dying off. And as I start to point out the, the grey squirrel control, uh, grey squirrel damage, they'll be starting to pick it up and they start seeing it and they start seeing it everywhere. So uh, being able to concentrate my efforts in these certain areas where there's lots of control happening around it uh, focuses my energy uh, in, in the same but in the opposite uh, sense. If somebody's doing control out by themselves, I know that I can start spreading around those areas. I can start saying to people, this is what's happening here. Uh, these are the kind of figures that they're, um, they're getting with their control. If you can do work, you'll, you'll be finding benefits uh, in, within your woodland. So this kind of mapping helps to, to focus, focus, the, uh, focus my energy. Uh, this picks up on, on all types of control, whether it's air rifle shooting, uh, trapping or shotgun shooting. So it picks up on all different types of control. Uh, none of them work uh, by themselves. You need a bit of everything to, to make it work efficiently. So this is a bit more information about the, the Basque air, air rifle groups, uh, control groups that we run. So um, when I go out and see somebody, and uh, as Graham mentioned earlier, some people say, oh, I don't have enough money to do grey squirrel control. Uh, the grey squirrel uh, damage isn't high enough in their priority to, to spend money, which is sometimes which is, is fair enough. Um, the, we saw an opportunity here where we could collaborate with Basque. Uh, they've got lots of uh, members so when you become a member of BAS, you classify as if you're a shotgun shooter, a rifle shooter, uh, or whatever. Uh, so they can look through their database of members. All of their members are insured through the BAS uh, membership. They can see, uh, so if I go out and see a woodland owner, they don't have enough money to do their grey school control, but grey school is a problem. If I look up, uh, if I contact BAS and they look up on their database, they see that they've got... Uh, two uh, members within the local area that are, uh, are using air rifles. I'm able to, to bridge that gap, make that connection between the, the controller and the landowner, and to say to the controller, you enjoy being out and about, you enjoy uh, using your air rifle. Um, are you able to spend some time doing some gray squirrel control? I can say to the woodland owner, uh, I've got an, an opportunity to uh, offer you grey squirrel control uh, a cost, on a cost neutral basis and hopefully bridge that gap and, and get some control happening. So this has worked across uh, 10 sites in the National Forest at the moment, uh, including National Forest Woodland, uh, uh, National Forest Company owned woodland. Um, There's about 15 controllers. Some of the sites where they're a bit bigger, you can fit in a couple of controllers. So they're able to, to work as a group, uh, concentrate on certain different areas. The way that they do it is that they have a bait station. Um, so they have a hopper with, with feed in it. Um, they can put the uh, corn or whatever feed that the squirrels are, uh, are most attracted to in the hopper. Rather than walking around the woodland with a firearm, which if there's public access can be a bit of a, an issue, uh, they can draw the squirrels into one area where the, the feed hopper is. Uh, and they're able to set up a hide that they can um, disguise themselves in and uh, as the squirrels come to the hopper they're able to dispatch them. 
uh, it's a controlled environment, you know exactly how far away from the, the uh, quarry you are. So you're able to be more exact with your shooting. Uh, it means that, uh, again, it means that you're not wandering around the woods with, uh, with a firearm, uh, which can be a bit concerning to uh, members of the public. Uh, and it means that you're able to focus away from areas which are of high public access. Um, so if you've got lots of footpaths around your woodland that are around the edges of the woodland, you can concentrate the control into the center of the woodland. Um, as members of as the members of BASC are, are involved in this scheme, they go through a training process. So uh, the training process uh, confirms that they're uh, competent to, to use air rifles. They, they know the, the safety features, they know how to use them, uh, use the air rifles. It also gives them a bit of training in how to uh, deal with members of the public. If somebody does approach you, what, what do you talk about? What do you say? How do you approach the issue of, of grey squirrels? Uh, maybe the, the controllers are able to point out some of the, uh, the damage that is around. With all of this, uh, with the Basque control groups, we also receive coal returns. So we're able to receive data on, on how, uh, how many squirrels they're taking, uh, which is useful to compare against historical records. Um, but also uh, look at whether they're doing enough. Uh, and with this, we started just getting coal returns, uh, and you can see somebody's uh, somebody's shooting 20 squirrels a year, somebody's shooting five squirrels a year. You know, you'd presume that the guy shooting uh, 20 squirrels a year is going to be doing a better job than the, the person doing five squirrels a year, but that's not necessarily true. Um, depending on the on the woodlands, the size, what kind of habitats there. The, the control level can be uh, variable to, to different extents. So part of the, the work that we've introduced recently is uh, the use of damage assessments. I'll go on to this a bit further on the next, next slide. So the damage assessments, uh, they're based on the, the deer impact and activity assessments uh, that some of you may know, uh, but basically you, uh, have a transect that you walk around the woodland, depending on its size uh, and, and what kind of habitats you're in, you, you pick a, a, a random transect through, through the woodland. Uh, you record any impacts such as uh, gray squirrel damage, uh, such as the bark stripping. Uh, so you record the impacts and the activity. So the activity could actually be seeing gray squirrels on site. It could be uh, feeding sites, it could be squirrel drays. So you walk a transect around the woodland and you record what, what, uh, what you see. And if you do this in the first year that you undertake control, that's a baseline. You've set a baseline. This is how much damage we can see in the woodland at the moment. Uh, you look uh, at the severity of the damage, whether it's the uh, number one, so just those small patches of damage that are easily repairable uh, going through the scales to to damage which is, is severe and, and, and lethal to the tree. So once you set that baseline, you're able to, to go back in future years, whether you do it every year or every two years, you're able to go back and say, damage is either the same, same level of damage is happening, uh, the damage is increasing, uh, the damage is it's decreasing. And as you monitor to see how that damage and act, uh, impact and activity is fluctuating, you can uh, change your control intensity to, to match that. If, you're, if the control, if the impacts and activity is going down, you know that you're doing enough to, to decrease the population. Uh, if, if the impact and activity is maintaining, then you know you're doing enough to just maintain the population. And if it's increasing, then you know that you need to do more. So this is a, a great way of being able to quantify what what impact and activity the, the squirrel is is having on the woodland um, and it's it's a great way of justifying the level of control that you undertake in your woodland so i think that's it yeah hopefully i've given you a bit of an overview as to what the national forest is uh what the the risk and the um the damage that the squir gray squirrels are having on on the national forest and 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 what we're doing about it uh in in my opinion um gray squirrels are one of the biggest threats to the national forest area um like i said already people have spent uh, a lot of time a lot of effort a lot of money on, on growing the woodland uh, and it can take a year for gray squirrels to come in 
cause them damage and, and, and totally uh, change the way that the woodland is going to perform going forward, not only economically, that it's not going to make them as much money, but also for those environmental and, and uh, social uh, values. Uh, thank you very much. And I think I'll do questions at the end. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, and now we move on to David Bliss. David, do you want to start your... Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, just try and share the screen. Yeah. I'm just getting there. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Yep. <laughs> I'm just going to get that right. There we go. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm talking today as the uh, CEO of the Lavra Estate, also a trustee of the Red Squ Squirrel Survival Trust. Um, the Lauder Estate is based up in uh, Cumbria, right on the border with Scotland, in the, uh, just below Penrith. Some of you have noticed it on the M6 that you drive through. Um, firstly, uh, we do have red squirrels. And the reason we have red squirrels uh, on the frontier that we live in is down to uh, the Penrith and District Red Squirrel Group, um, who over the last decades of uh, effort that they've put in have managed to protect the frontier. So we're talking about characters such as Robert Benson and Ian Jack, um, who are trustees of the group and have fought hard at Lava over those years to secure the home of the Red. And we've also got Jerry Moss on the ground, who is the main person actually uh, fighting the Greys for us. So, you know, it's, it's a great thank you to them. But also we fully realise that we're holding the frontier and to... Uh, stop the advance as it were we do need the immune contraception uh, that we're talking about and that the red squirrel survival trust are working so hard to bring forward to try and stem that flow of ever increasing grays onto the red so i want to talk to you today about how lauber is looking after the red squirrels and developing the habitat for those red squirrels and how we're making it hopefully a diverse landscape while producing productive timber so, supported by a higher tier scheme, Ian Jack put together a plan to plant 620 acres of new woodland, um, which inevitably led to a 900 acre wood when it joined onto the existing woodland. This woodland was uh, plant started planning in 16, took two years of planning, and it's now completely planted, mainly Sitka spruce. So, we are into productive timber production but another 40% of it is also broadleaf woodland around the edge, as it were, framing the, the woodland. We'll go into more detail of it as we go through, but it's also got a major uh, re, uh, river re meandering scheme attached to it as well. Uh, it also enabled us to have our first sale of carbon from the estate, which again improved the viability of the planting. With the, uh, the woodland, we, we quickly realised that we also need to be looking after the rest of the habitat. Uh, the rest of the habitat on the uh, Lauber Estate, you know, the area we're talking about is about 4,000 acres. You can't just plonk a, a woodland in the middle of it and forget about the rest. Um, we wanted to uh, look after our endangered species and the other areas we want to improve our soils. Um, and we wanted to improve uh, the habitat we've got for our pollinators. So we entered into a woodland pasture scheme, which we'll talk about as we go through. But that woodland pasture scheme uh, has led to the planting of another 220,000 trees um, and 3,000 shrubs and an awful lot of uh, wildflower meadows, which has given a lot of pleasure to a lot of people locally. It's also led us to understand the control of our predators more. Because we have greys, but we also have voles, and voles kill more trees for us than the greys 
So the vol damage is absolutely catastrophic sometimes um, because we've had a bounce of vols last year. So our woodland uh, trees planted in shelters, we can lose 25% of those in year two to vols. So and we suddenly realised that we're totally out of kilter with our predators. So we're busy putting in predator posts now, trying to get our birds of prey um, to try and level up the, uh, the competition, as it were. So I plan just showing the area because it's it's quite interesting just to see uh, what I suppose the area we're talking about. You can see the M6 coming up from the south to the north on the right hand side of Jack's Forest. Jack's Forest, named after Ian Jack who planned it, uh, is sitting there in the bottom southeast corner of 900 acres. Surrounding Jack's Forest is the rest of uh, what was a, a deer park area, well, still is a deer park area, designated deer park, um, and we're grazing that very extensively now. Um, indeed, you know, many would say we're completely rewilding it, but we're also planting woodland pasture in it and restoring it. So we see it as a restoration process as opposed to um, anything else. You'll see the small compartments of woodland that are being planted. Uh, those are our woodland pasture areas, which are all broadleaf woodland, uh, with 50 uh, park trees in between those as well. And then on the left hand side, you'll see our South Riverside areas, and that's where we're making space for water. So these are canalised rivers. You'll see pictures of as we go through that are being uh, re canalised to make space for the water to express itself onto the uh, floodplain during the winter months. It's vital when you're doing anything in the landscape to keep working with all your ecosystem assets. Uh, you know, the one that we're particularly keep, keen on protecting and explaining to people is uh, the limestone pavements that we have, uh, but also the, the man-made lime kilns that are left and the historical archaeology underneath the ground. So working with the national grid, we've got a major scheme coming forward there to start explaining the environment to the people that are starting to enjoy the Lava Estate. So how are we establishing our woodland pasture? Because woodland pasture is you know, covering a larger area than our productive woodland, and we still see that as uh, essential uh, timber production in years to come. Um, we've got 250 Longhorn cattle and Abdeen Angus cattle, we're gradually phasing ourselves completely across to the Longhorn, which graze differently. Um, we're wanting them to be able to run outside all winter, as opposed to housing them intensively. We're uh, looking at the carbon footprint of that type of system, as opposed to the one where we're housing them and carting slurry and uh, feeding them in, inside all winter. Um, and importantly, we're running at extremely low stocking rates. We're talking about 100 kilograms of beef per hectare. So that's as low as low. You know, we used to be on a cow an acre. So to go down to 100 kilos per hectare you know, is really giving us diversity change. These are some of the Anguses that will be gradually, well, most of them have been sold now, but we were producing beef for Scott beef. And you can see the difference in the sward heights and things. Um, and this is something we're moving away from and just going on to totally extensive. You can see in the bottom picture, you know, a mown field, a graze field, the fertilizer spread again, the top beside the wood. You know, the runoff on our soils before we started this change was quite extraordinary. You know, we would see brown water running down roads. We would see brown water going into our rivers. And it was almost accepted as being normal. It, it's not normal, really. It's something that has to, had to change. So with the help of uh, Eden Rivers Trust, as you'll see, they've led us on a, an educational change. Woodland pasture, this is what we're looking at in our minds in 140 years, if we get it right. Grazed areas, beautiful trees, beautiful landscape. You know, at the, I suppose, well, the park was cleared of its trees during the war effort. And we've got the remnants of uh, the trees left behind the stumps. And what we're doing now in, in, is planting beside those stumps that you know, Ian took forward and planted the first tranche 20 years ago. And we're now starting to see the benefits of that landscape coming back. So this is the, the shot of 
again, what we're looking for, we're looking for scrub to grow under those trees in certain areas. We're looking for the anthills. We're looking for the tussocky grass that will allow the voles to live, but also for the owls to hunt those areas. We're looking, we're looking for the fact that it's going to be a sponge and it's going to slow the water to stop it pouring down the hill into our rivers. We're up to a thousand feet in height. So, and we're with a heavy rainfall on a thousand feet, we were losing our soils. And when you lose your soil on a limestone uh, base, very quickly you get exposure of the rock. Once you get to that point, you know, it takes a long time to make soil again. Our pollution wasn't just through runoff, it was also the fact that we're on limestone. So that through the limestone fissures, you get the, directly into the aquifers below. We have deer, and that's a, another debate on productive timber. You know, uh, we've got uh, deer in the park, which have been here many years, hundreds of years, but we've also got deer up on the fells. So managing those deer is a real challenge to us. Um, so our biggest threat to the woodland, uh, the commercial woodland is deer. So we have to deer fence the whole wood. Uh, so we've deer fenced 900 acres um, just to protect it from the roe deer as well. But it's important to give these deer habitat. So we are looking at reducing our deer numbers within the park and gradually uh, fencing larger areas for them so we can get even the deer at a lower footprint. To get change, you need soil disturbance. So uh, radically, we've got pigs and the pigs open the soil for us. With the pigs opening the soil, we get regeneration. And you know, the regeneration can be quite amazing. Even in year one, we're we'll finding that the pigs know exactly where they're going. They work over the soil, open that soil up, and they leave behind the seeds. So as a result, you do see regeneration happening. Whereas if it was a solid grass sward, it would take many more years. We're looking at reintroductions. Um, we'll talk about the beaver in a, in a second, but at the moment, your one introduction we're talking about is stalks. And people say to me, why are you talking about things like that? And I say, well, well why not? You know, we're lucky enough to be blessed with the land that we've got at the moment. And if we can't demonstrate change to people to come and look at and consider, um, we, we, we think we're managing it incorrectly. We want to be challenged. We want people to come and see the potential benefits. And you know, what did the stalk do wrong? You know, it was taken out during the Civil War and uh, we can't see any harm it would do to be reintroduced into the environment. Only benefit. Radically, we're uh, introducing grazes into our woodland. So, uh, and we're not talking about the uh, areas of protected by medieval wall systems. We're talking about the, uh, the woodlands that were planted and protected by wire in the last 70 years. Those younger areas of woodland where the flora and fauna have been forced back into, we're taking the fences down. So in this project so far, we've removed something like 70 kilometers of wire fences that's been erected after the Second World War. And that's allowed the cattle back into those woods slowly. And as the cattle go back in, we start, we lose the sharp side to those woods, that fenced line, and we start to see it, hopefully see it fan out across the grazed area. One of our keystone markers, I suppose, is the, is the bee. Um, Jim Lauver uh, apps, you know, works extremely hard with the bee business that he's got, and he's built up a business that is over 400 beehives now. And that's really how we're judging our change. Um, we go into several estates with the bees. And unfortunately, Lauford doesn't perform very well at the moment on the fact that we haven't got the right pollen. Um, he's had bees on other estates this year, which have uh, far, been far superior in honey yield. And that's what we're looking for, is to improve our honey yield. So we actually know that we've got uh, the right home for pollinators. If bees are happy, the rest of the pollinators are happy. We talked about uh, Jack's wood at the very beginning and how uh, woods slow the flow of water runoff. Well, this is quite an interesting photograph. Um, if you look right into the horizon of the photograph at the back, you'll see uh, Jack's wood 
has just been planted, you can pick up some rows of the sitka at the top and at the bottom left, you can see some of the broadleaf planting. There was a stream that flowed through there called Bessie Gill. That stream was diverted in the 60s when the uh, motorway went through. And thanks to uh, Eden Rivers Trust, um, the planning on this, I think it was probably four or five years, five years ago at least, uh, again, Ian planning with the Eden Rivers Trust, uh, we re-diverted the Bessie Gill back through its old original floodplain. So we haven't created a channel for it at the top end, we've just let it flow through the woodland and planted willow and alder. And then we've got this new, well, we've got this restored attenuation pond effectively at the bottom. So this pond was uh, drained and levelled uh, by Jim's father. And then we've got the original uh, paintings of it or the landscape of the park showing it initially uh, 250 years ago. And we've now managed to restore that landscape. But more importantly, we're also monitoring the change. So we were monitoring the flow of the river beforehand when it was a grassland field grazed intensively with sheep. And now we're monitoring it with trees and hoping to see the, the actual benefit of the woodland by slowing the flow. River naturalization, um, again, you know, canalized rivers um, done by the Victorians, uh, allowing the river to be yeah, a fast flowing river, but a river that's not able to use its floodplain. Um, we've uh, been lucky enough again working with Eden Rivers Trust to do a major project of re-meandering this, this river, which has again led to more productive and woodland pasture planting. So this picture shows the original floodplain and the yellow is the canalized river belting through. And you can see how straight it is. And you can see the old paleo channels on the left-hand side on the west. And uh, we've managed to put riffles into the river. So we've moved about 10,000 tons of stone into the river in two or three, two places. And that's slowing the flow of the river and asking it to uh, spill out onto the floodplain on the left and use all that land of 60 hectares uh, to, uh, I suppose, flood more often. In the past, it may be flooded eight times a year, whereas now it'll be expected to almost sit in water after the first flood for the majority of the winter. So again, great environmental change, allowing all our endangered species to start moving back into. That includes, for example, you know, already snipe have moved in, which is quite incredible after the first rains. And it's also where our, the picture on the left shows where our beaver release uh, is. So we fenced an area there, it's a fence release, 27 acres uh, for, for the beaver reintroduction, which, which I know is controversial, but I think vital that people like us can at least demonstrate to people how beavers work in environment. We expect uh, with the river re-meandering huge change on the, on the landscape as it swaps over into, in, from improved grassland into swamp and flush and fen. This is a better slide just showing that what we hope to end up with from an intensively managed field of grazed mown grass uh, into these different habitats for birds and invertebrates. So the beaver, um, you know, challenging subject, but I think, you know, especially when we're talking to a lot of foresters, uh, but we think, yeah, essential for our uh, landscape. Uh, we think we can use the beaver and the beaver can help us enormously to protect our soils, uh, to protect our water, to clean our water, to, uh, to allow us to demonstrate to the farming community and other landowners that the beaver can fit in um, and improve what has become, in our case, and I'm not saying in other people's case, it's very much different, but ours was certainly a degraded landscape with an awful lot of erosion going on. Um, and we're very excited about it and keen to start explaining to people that the beaver can be a benefit. Small dams get built, flow gets held back in the floodplain for longer periods. Fish can still pass 
through. Um, and yeah, the damage that we're seeing to trees, but well, it's not damage, but we're seeing it's effectively coppicing of woodland, um, which I suppose gives us what we want is a diverse forest. I think that's uh, that's me. Hopefully, it gives you an insight of what we're doing at Lauber. And uh, if anyone would in the future like to come and see us or talk to us, we'd be more than welcome to show people around. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, David. And it's great that you have such useful graceful or positive gray squirrel management going on there that uh, you can do so much uh, planting. And if everybody wants to turn their microphones and their screens back on, that's great. <laughs> Uh, we've had a couple of questions. One, I think it's towards to Graham. Uh, the population of greys is increasing. It's not 2.5 million, as everyone quotes. Do future projections of damage costs take this into account? Uh, no, no, I was looking backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, there's, there's interesting things. Um, I mean, one is certainly, I think the impetus towards more control is beginning to happen, which is great. Uh, there's good news, you know, the, 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 the fact that the, the UK Squirrel Accord exists and that the, the government agencies are on side is really, really helpful. Uh, and, and, and even the NGOs who've been, you know, probably a little bit quiet, but actually I think they're beginning to realise actually, you know, this is a serious problem, which we've, we've always known in forestry, it is a serious problem. So I, I'd like to think that the level of control will, will increase. Um, the work with, with, with Pine Martin release in the West is, is, is useful. Um, but there's still a long way to go and you know I mean I, I was going to ask Daniel but you know the work from Game Wildlife Conservation Trust a few years ago basically said you know they, they'd done some experience they, they cleared out grey squirrel populations out of 10 hectare 12 hectare woods completely one in successive years and then the year after having then stopped control they were back to square one again just by the end of the first year but it just kind of shows that the reintroduction rate when you're doing some control is fierce it's absolutely fierce which means you're just stuck in this never-ending cycle of control 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 when you've got neighbors perhaps who aren't doing anything around you and that's why why landscape scale stuff really matters why talking to your neighbors matters and why ultimately trying to find these big solutions like the imc work uh, really matters I know you've answered this in the chat, Graham, but I'm just going to ask the question again for the benefit yeah, of the okay. recording. Um, but how much damage do red squirrels do to woodland? The evidence, uh, looking back at the old records that I've seen uh, from, from clients, estates, uh, records, shooting clubs, is that, you know, they, they will do some damage, but it's, it's modest in, uh, in comparison. It, it is modest. Um, and from what I've seen, it's a little bit like the damage of the grey squirrel in its native home yeah uh, what i've read and seen over there is that you know in, a, in occasional years they'll get a little bit of damage in, in america with gray squirrels on trees it's modest it's acceptable it's in the, the foresters are saying it's, in, it's insignificant um, and the difference really is that we have our, our, the grays here live at much higher densities than the, than the reds do here and so they place that 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 kind of feeding pressure and environmental pressure and tree damage pressure um, and what, what's very noticeable is that, that when you get them over a wintering well after a good mast year, it's that year after that, that, that when, when, the, when you get an awful lot of damage, when the population all of a sudden goes, um, so, you know, that's why, that's why constant downward pressure through control, whether it's through control groups, whether it's through gamekeepers, whether it's through foresters doing their thing, uh, is necessary. It, and that's kind of why, it, we need to solve it because it's just like this drip tap, um, dripping tap of cost on every single forestry account on every single estate in the country. Hmm. Thanks, Graham. Um, I think this question came in while Dan was speaking. So, do you want to import some of our Scottish pine martins? <laughs> That'd be lovely. Um, I think uh, Graham's got more experience in, in the pine martin world uh, where there's, there's nothing in the national forest uh, uh, in terms of uh, pine martin population. Uh, but looking at all of the different methods of, of, of uh, grey squirrel control is important. There's not one silver bullet. It's not just do shooting, just do trapping, uh, just bio um, control. So there, uh, there needs to be, be uh, thought on, on all different methods. 
Mm. And I know we've spoken about this before, Graham, but the, the issue with um, red squirrel damage potentially in the past being exacerbated by the lack of predators? Yeah, I mean, if there's a lack of predators, then, then the population goes out of, out of, out of kilter. I mean, it's, it's been really interesting watching, watching, you know, listening to David's talk, watching some of the stuff that's going on in America in terms of getting the apex predators right. And actually the, the, the whole ecological structure starts to function more as it should. Um, and, um, and, you know, we, 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 uh, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what went first, whether it was the, the habitat first or the, or the, or the, um, pine martin, but, uh, uh, it's a combination of both, really, back in the back in the days of the Georgians and the early Victorians, and um, and we need to get them back into the landscape. You know, they 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 comfortably uh, pine martins comfortably coexist with reds. They do in Scotland. There's no reason why they shouldn't in England and Wales. They do in Ireland. They do you know on the continent. So um, the comfortable coexistence is, is got of, of a species that should, both of which should be there in the natural landscape should be fine. And actually, then, if you, even if there is a little bit of um, collateral damage on or keeping population down on reds, actually, the whole system works. It isn't just about the grey squirrel. It isn't just about the red squirrel. It's about other things in the in the landscape as well. But it has, you know, these things have to be kept in balance. Is there anything that, that I think that's all the questions? Is is there anything any of you want to say before we final? I was I was going to ask Daniel whether that statement that I was just made about reintroduction back backfill reintroduction rates is that what you see in the national forest yeah definitely um there's one particular site that comes to mind the trap is uh, that manages it is probably the the hottest on 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 squirrel control uh, that that I know of in the national forest uh, he'll take i think he's got about well, i can't remember the the coal records but it's uh, vast amounts each year and uh, one year he had a health issue and wasn't able to, to do any. And that year that he didn't do any, there was uh, damage uh, coming in. So it's, it's, it's very prevalent. And uh, the landscape scale control is, is, is key to, to stopping that uh, because we, we've got such great connectivity between the woodland now. Uh, it's really, really paramount to, to make sure everybody's on board, everybody understands the issues and, and everybody's doing their bit. Mm, that's good. One thing I'll just add there is that the, uh, what I think is interesting about Ireland, I mean, we were talking about this before the presentations, but um, when the pine martin, when uh, the reason the pine, I'm pretty sure the reason the pine martin was able to spread east from the Shannon, it had pre previously just been west, was the fact that the, the uh, you know, they'd been busy of foresting and all of a sudden there was then habitat and it was, it was spruce and it was broadleaves, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of planting had gone on in Ireland all of a sudden the, the landscape which had been like 4% woodland cover it was up to 10 12 15% over a period of time the, eventually you get you get trees that are big enough for pine martins to be comfortable in and, and then they can start to move yeah and I yeah I wouldn't be I wouldn't be averse to think about pine martin in the in the, in the national forest Daniel yeah definitely <laughs> yeah, you, if you get if you're going to be headed for a 33% wooded, wooded cover I think it could probably cope with it quite comfortably <laughs> yeah currently we're we're trying to manage a uh, an, an unnatural system where there's there's pest species and predator species well the predator species aren't present uh, mm. we're trying to control the pest species and that that natural uh, system is, is broken and we're trying to uh, uh, impose what what the natural predators would do uh, mm. if we're able to to get a, a natural predator that is it, uh, able to achieve that uh, it, it's it's uh, re reconnecting all the dots isn't it and, and making that that process better and like you described uh, in america where uh, introduce the wolves back into yellowstone not only controls the population but moves moves the pest around moves the uh, uh makes it the the process work again which yeah. is, is is what we want i think yeah 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 um we just had one more coming are there any videos of gray's bark stripping bark um well we're just working on a short film at the moment um on grey squirrel bark stripping to highlight the issue. And we put a couple of wildlife cameras out and about. So we do have a couple of clips of grey squirrels actually bark stripping that we're going to include in that later in the year, which should be released during National Tree Week. Uh, yeah, brilliant, it's good. Um, I 
think that's it for everything. So just a big thank you to all of our speakers for sharing lots of important information on this subject. And thank you wherever you are for joining us. Um, I will make this webinar available on the Squirrel Accord website at a later date. Uh, and if you have any suggestions of other webinars you'd like us to organise, then please let me know. Um, and thanks again and keep an eye on our website for other events at www.squirrelaccord.uk slash events. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.